So I, th I think Jeremy set the challenge. <laughs> X years from now, malaria and TB will not be a problem on the planet. It's just a question of how we get to that position uh, along with uh, 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 solving other medicinal problems. So uh, Harper, maybe start with you to give a economist's uh, perspective on the, the issues of affordable medicines. Yeah, um, I'll first start off by saying I'm not actually an economist by background. So um, I am a pharmacist. I worked in healthcare for a number of years, um, actually specialised in AMR. Um, and I've, my career has kind of uh, led to the position I'm in now, which I'll, I'll touch upon a bit. It requires a little bit of discussion around how I got to here. So I kind of um, I did a PhD in antibiotics. I then uh, worked with Public Health England on launching Target Antibiotics. Uh, which is still around today and doing really well. Um, I then moved back into, I would say, senior pharmacist roles in rare diseases and AMR again. And actually, uh, QE uh, Hospital in Birmingham uh, is where we had uh, one of those Ebola centers as well that we uh, helped set up. Um, and then uh, moving into industry um, and working uh, on Drive AB, which was uh, on the reimbursement side. Um, was a fascinating journey in terms of how you try and reshape the model around uh, something as difficult as AMR and, and try and rejuvenate that environment. And I guess that whole uh, landscape for me is what has brought me to this position today in terms of we have a number of conditions, and I have worked in rare diseases as well over the last three, four years, and you have these conditions where companies are kind of... Um, investing in developing these new therapies, but what they really lack when they come to launch is a real understanding of the, the true landscape of the issues you're facing. And for me, uh, what we're doing right now is developing that landscape. So from a, a health economist point of view, or pharmacist point of view, um, whatever my background is, um, the way I'm looking at it is, is how do we build that understanding of that true patient journey of the healthcare they're receiving and the condition they're suffering from? Um, and trying to build a picture of the true cost of that burden. Um, I'm really fortunate the company I work with now, um, the CEO is uh, a haemophilia patient by back, you know, he is a haemophilia patient. He also suffers from HIV, but he's a true health economist. He's worked with ISA, for example, in the US to reshape how they treat haemophilia patients. He's now working on gene therapy as well. So having to work with an individual like that, um, who is a, a patient himself, and see the true visionary style he has in terms of reshaping the landscape has been truly uh, immense. And I work with him from an industry perspective and now working directly. But when we look at some of the rare conditions as well, such as sickle cell, for me, is a, is a huge one right now. Um, a number of companies are, uh, are kind of working that space as well at the moment. But there's a real disconnect between the patients and um, the treatment they're receiving and the healthcare systems as well. And it all comes back to the politics, as Jeremy was saying. These patients are really disconnected because they are from um, backgrounds that don't really connect with politics or you know, they feel really disconnected from society in general. And that plays out in the way they're treated as well. So for us as a company, we're working in the Middle East, we're working in Africa to really shape that environment. I think when it comes to issues like AMR, one of the things I'm working on right now is actually setting up a social enterprise where we are working with um, uh, individuals who are developing new treatments and new diagnostics um, and doing that in a way that actually we're not looking to profiteer, we're looking to set up in countries where there are limited infrastructure, but to bring those individuals and healthcare systems and, and patients on that journey from day one to say actually these are opportunities for you to engage in uh, in making your healthcare systems better rather than waiting for a the, the model we have at the moment, which is, uh, you know, the developed countries develop these, uh, you know, molecules to have this, the, the landscapes sort of individuals there to really shape what that direction should look like. And then we go to these other countries and donate our time and our effort and our molecules and our treatments to support them. And the way that we're looking at now in terms of work I'm doing is actually saying we're going to invest in you. We're going to invest in the, the amount of time we spend with you to really uh, expand your understanding of what you're facing in your society and to bring you on that journey to a point where you become self-sufficient and then you're part of the, the wider picture as well. So it is around kind of engagement of, of uh, societies that I would say are slightly more disengaged. Um, but in terms of reimbursement, you know, AMR was a great example for me, but if you look at rare diseases in the UK, um, you know, I worked with a company where we had reimbursement for uh, one rare disease based on a trial of 16 patients. 
So you, you talk about huge uh, patient numbers, and then you come to the uh, reimbursement that we achieved in the UK with NICE and NHS England on a, on a trial based on 16 patients. <laughs> and for me, it just shows you how strong the patient voice can be. Uh, and like what Jeremy said as well, in terms of um, sometimes where the patient voice is lacking, that's really when you need the, the, the clinicians, the experts to really step up on behalf of the patients to really drive that. And the example I use in AMI is uh, Ron Daniels in the Sepsis Trust and, and the great work he's done over the years. And he started working with us on, on target antibiotics very early on. Um, and we kind of grew that together. But if you look at the journey we faced then in terms of just engagement of primary care and, and the issues of sepsis, where I used to get laughed out of buildings and meetings with GPs, to the point we are now where the whole direction of sepsis care is around focusing on it from a primary care perspective is massively a huge change in, in the way we you know, look at conditions as well. So I guess from my perspective, I look at it from a global perspective, I can look at it from a UK perspective, I'm more than happy to take questions from, from all those sides and, and the social enterprise as well, but um, I hope that gives a little bit of an overview. So do you think in the AMR specific question, yeah. is, is a problem with commercial returns for companies? In some areas, I would say, I do think it's possible to make money out of antibiotics. I think, but should we be thinking about not-for-profit type enterprises? Yeah, I think I've, I've kind of worked at AMR um, on and off in my career. I kind of left it in periods because of frustrations I felt with it, um, to be completely honest. And having worked in all the different sectors, I. From my perspective, um, they all do great things, um, hugely talented individuals within all those sectors that are doing massive, uh, you know, huge strides in the way we treat AMR. But the one thing missing for me is that whole dis disconnect between, we look at the value of antibiotics, it's really hard to <coughs> contextualize what that value is. You could have a cancer patient, for example, who, you know, you're paying hundreds of thousands, millions of pounds worth of treatment on, and, in a, you know, they can die of, of an infection. When we look at you know, clinical trials in, in, in cancer and um, you know, hematology in general as well, and I worked in those areas as well, within those you know, trials as well, they always say that antibiotics are standard of care. So when you contextualize that, you know, what, was, what was the antibiotic used in? That, that information will be so valuable to collect in terms of you know, cancer and hematology trials in general. What antibiotic did you use? Because that could inform how we treat those patients, because not all antibiotics are Correct, the many cancer patients die of infections, <laughs> exactly. of blood cancer, whatever, and that's, well, it's a research project in itself. But I just, so this is an unfair question to ask you, but just one of those run issue while Jeremy's here. But the biggest resource the planet has is, is its young people. And they're mostly not in Europe or Japan, whatever. They're in, they're going to be in Indonesia, Turkey, Africa, whatever. Mm -hmm. So this is unfair to ask you this question. I know I was really going to ask it to Jeremy. How do we engage those people? Because they're the people that are going to really solve our problems. I think it is about um, actually setting up at the moment, the way we're set up in society is that we do look at the US and the UK and Germany and France as hubs of you know, <coughs> science. And, and that's kind of where I travel to, you know, to, to liaise with individuals. It is about how we bring that science into those countries now and, and how we engage them and how we educate them into a point where they feel like they're engaged in the discussions that are taking place. If you look at AMR, for example, uh, a lot of discussions are taking place in, in the US and UK, and, and that's great. Um, and the wait, you know, it, it probably will continue for a while. But to continue that, we do need to start engaging these countries a lot more uh, in AMR to get their true understanding of the issues they face, and from a patient perspective as well. For me, uh, it's and there's issue. outstanding researchers in those potential Absolutely, in those yeah. countries. Yeah. We need to use better than we are. But Malcolm, maybe you talk a little bit about GSK's work. Sure, in just, the, just on the AMR point, though, and Jeremy is here. I mean, we we both did a project a few years back now where. We, you know, gram-negative antimicrobials, if you want them to sit on the shelf, you don't want to make money out of them. Um, just use them when you really need to. And the, and the trust helped de-risk uh, by putting in four million, we put in four million. Um, we've got a guy in the US, David Payne, who's passionate about getting uh, new antimicrobials to market. And he's been very open and honest about how unsuccessful our large screening campaigns have been. But we wrote that contract in such a way that others could come in. And I'd never heard of DITRA, Defence Threat Research Agency. They came in with $30 million. So we went from having the smallest gram-negative programme on the planet to the largest in quite a short time. And that was catalysed by the trust and an openness to engage with other workers. All they wanted back from that was the white powder threat. You know, they wanted 
uh, margin rights for manufacturing if we actually found something. Um, if we wouldn't make it, well, why would we not make it? You know, we need more relationships like that. Um, moving on to me, uh, I used to work with Chaz, so he's been a neuroscientist for 20 odd years, but for the last quarter of a century, I've looked after academic collaboration. So I collaborate with people globally. Um, I think we've got, well, I know we've got just over a thousand collaborations in 29 countries, uh, a lot in Africa. Uh, and quite a few increasingly in, in the Far East. And I was reflecting yesterday, it was a bit, it was a, it's a little bit negative. You know, we beat ourselves up a lot in the UK and I'm thinking, well, when I first came to the interface and I really didn't know the rules, I can remember going to EPSRC to get, and we thought combinatorial chemistry um, was gonna be our savior, like we think AI is gonna be our savior now. Little did I know that that wasn't to be the case, but. I did the first ever single research council, single company initiative, because I didn't know the rules. I had to go to public accounts committee and national audit office to, to get that thing through. Um, Claxo and Wellcome hadn't merged. I mean, because our model is broken and we're not doing very well, you know, you're seeing greater and greater consolidation and acquisition of companies. <coughs> so it's truly ironic. Um, you know, Claxo and Wellcome merged, Wellcome Trust then became, because they sold the, the welcome part of the business, and so then became one of the richest uh, medical charities in the world. At that time, uh, I don't know how many people might remember back to this, but there were Welcome Trust grant conditions, which pretty much prohibited you. If you signed up to Welcome Trust grant conditions, you could not then really work with pharma because the IP was uh, like a real issue. Some people, Chris, I know, you know, didn't take any notice of those regulations, but, but most did. Um, and of course then we got to the new era and they ripped up the grant conditions. Uh, we are so lucky to have the Wellcome Trust over the road there. Absolutely driven UK science. And one of the things that helped that was to introduce a lot of academic scientists to a great network, because they only work with good people. I think we only work with good people. To great people who actually knew about drug development or the, or the part that we know about. Um, and through seeding drug discovery, actually drove the biotech industry in the UK. So I'm, I'm disappointed that that in its old form doesn't still, um, you know, isn't, uh, isn't still operating today. But arguably those early things led to bigger initiatives as well. And the end, oh, massive. you have Carbex. Yep. Uh, and across Europe, there's the Innovative Medicines Initiative, which from my perspective is a really fantastic thing. And the only thing wrong with it, it needs sort of 10 or 100 times the funding. Maybe the 30 billion we put into, into HS2 went into that. It would, yep. You would get new drugs out of it. Yeah. Um, there weren't any, uh, 25 years ago, there weren't any consortia. They are now commonplace, to your point yeah. about IMI. I mean, I thought, I didn't realise Jeremy was going to be here for the session, but I thought um, Mike Ferguson would be. You know, it was actually SB, I was in Glaxo, it was actually SB who um, convinced Philip Cohen that he should do a consortium in signalling. Uh, you know, that consortium is still going on 21 years later. So, you know, they must be doing something right. It's got fewer companies in now. Um, Glaxo, people forget it was Glaxo who had the idea for the Structural Genomics Consortium. It's Rob Cook and I went over the road uh, to ask the Wellcome Trust if they would broker the SGC. And they said, yeah, we'd love to do that. And we were all going to be in for three million each. Uh, we had a conversation which lasted more than a year where we had uh, 11 pharma companies then and IBM who wanted to, instead of money, give us last year's uh, IT equipment. Um, one by one, the companies dropped out because, well, if it's all going to end up in Brookhaven database, you know, why would we do that? You know, it's all going to be in the public domain. And they completely missed the point. Then, of course, four years on, we then tried to recruit someone in the United Kingdom. And because of the mentality of the people here, we went to the best crystallographers. And they all said, well, just double the size of our group. We can do all that. Again, they missed the point. And then we've got Alley Woods, different kettle of kippers. Uh, the trust, bless them, came in with uh, 18 million to match, to go with our 3 million. Then the Wallenberg came in, so we had Karolinska, Oxford, Toronto. We helped semi-industrialize because that's you know what we're good at, multi-parallel um, science and getting people to think about things differently. And you got that added to the academic lateral thought that you then kind of hone in. And they used to have regular phone calls. So if they identified something in Toronto, Oxford and the Karolinska would know about it within a fortnight. 
and it, it worked really well. And I've always believed that the more open you are, the more stuff you push out, the more you get back. And if you're always straight with people and you tell them why you're attempting to do what you're trying to do, if you disagree early on, go to the hard points, go to the money and the intellectual property, if that's the, if that's the major driver. And if you don't agree, shake hands and move on and try again another time. But then you start to get a reputation for it. And other companies are, you know, Merck do some really good things. Novartis do some really good things. I will pinch anyone's good ideas if it's going to drive things forward to work towards a new medicine. So I'll stop there. I'm on my soapbox. <laughs> OK. So uh, it's just good to get a perspective from Joe. And I should say one of the good news stories is that Merck are coming back and to do re more research in the UK. And I think that's a fantastic thing. And we want to, yeah, we like you coming back with 10,000 employees, not just. A, oh. yeah. uh, uh, so over to you, Joe. Yeah, so um, from my perspective, I'm very much more in the, in the early discovery through to the clinic space rather than, than the, the, the patient side of it. Um, just, just for some perspective, um, I was in um, the old paradigm in Pfizer, based down in Sandwich for 10 years as a pharmacologist, saw the old system where we, uh, you know, develop drugs in isolation, big silos, uh, build those walls high, and then at some point hand over to an unknown clinician and, and, and to put through to clinical trials. Um, <clears throat> subsequent to that in 2011, I branched out and, and worked in um, the Rare Diseases Consortium for Pfizer. And also um, I was based uh, at the National Heart and Lung Institute and I moved my laboratory there and actually looked at a different paradigm, a way to really understand how to combat attrition. So we took, uh, to the point about repurposing, took some drugs that were sitting on the shelf at Pfizer that, that they didn't necessarily know what they were going to do with them, um, and, and put them into really exquisite patient cell models. Um, and this was just before the onset of, of um, stem cells and, and iPSCs. So we, we were actually using patient tissue and, and, and using some of those culture systems, but really using it to interrogate those pathways and complementing the exquisite knowledge of those academics in Peter Barnes Group and, and, and uh, more widely across Imperial College with the tough questions that pharma need to ask in order to move projects forward. So I've, I've seen how it could work. Um, and then um, more recently, I joined uh, Merck six months ago um, really because I was attracted to the fact that, that they were actually investing in the UK and investing in setting up a new research group. And, and the whole idea was that we were going to do things differently, accelerate, leverage some of those tools, whether it is machine learning or, or, or whether or not to, to leverage um, the stem cell models that are, exist in, in this rich academic environment and link into the clinicians who are, are looking at different biomarkers in ageing. So um, some of those... Um, imaging biomarkers to, to really leverage a, a much more agile organisation. So at the moment we are uh, 30 people, we are going to grow to 150 over, the next, over a number of years. Um, <clears throat> but the whole reason for setting up in London uh, and, and here at King's Cross as well is that we can leverage being very close to Europe with Eurostar uh, and, and also very quick links up to the rest of the UK to really place ourselves close to those academic collaborators and also the regulators and, and the clinics as well. So um, it, it's, a, it's a really great opportunity, I think, to try and do things differently. And we've, we, we class ourselves as the speedboat uh, or the pilot ship, I guess, who are driving uh, out to try and change the way that, that things are occurring. So hopefully watch this space. We've been going, you know, just six months we, we've had staff. So, uh, yeah, we're, we're really setting up some some new collaborations. And to that point, we're looking at 50% uh, of our collaboration, uh, sorry, 50% of our budget actually being external collaborations. And I think that whole shift uh, from, from where I was a decade ago with that siloed, everything we know is in-house. So actually, we need this complementary, um, <clears throat> multidisciplinary um, team in order to deliver uh, those drugs of the future. So. Um, yeah. So political point you've heard from yeah. Jeremy and Harpel, how important politics is. Yeah. How important is it to you guys that we stay in the European Science Club? <laughs> oh, we need to get that message across yeah. to politics. Yeah. Because it's going to be important. There may well be a general election or a referendum soon. And many of us feel a bit guilty about not getting on our soapboxes last time. We mm -hmm. have to, if this happens, even if it doesn't happen, we still need to, well, be, yeah, what's yeah. your opinion so, on that? So I, th I think uh, specifically as well, the UK has, has traditionally been a draw for the talent from across the EU, but across the world as well. And the, the attractiveness is actually bringing those people together from 
all across the world to work together. And I think what, what we've seen recently is people uh, maybe have been a bit more reluctant to take up jobs in London and perhaps, or, or the UK in general and have pulled back and, and, and applied and to, to Europe. So whilst that's Europe's boon, I, th I think we really need to work hard on attracting them to this ecosystem. So, so this may be happening already, I don't know. It's good to have specific things come out of these meetings. You know, if leading people from your companies, Novartis also coming back to the UK in terms of research, mm -hmm. are you, it would be great if you went to the chancellor or <laughs> the person and just said, it's really important that we do stay mm -hmm. in this club because you'll, you'll count more than us. And I, th I think they will listen, the politicians. Yeah. They just don't understand yeah. the process, most of them. No, I, I agree. And, and in fact, because we've been quite high profile in the UK bringing science back, we've had a number of visitors as well, uh, you know, from politicians want to come, to come and look at our, our labs as well. And I think it's really important to deliver that message. OK, that's an action for Chaz and Bev to make that, <laughs> <laughs> that happen. Yeah. Chaz. Yes, I think when I was talking to Malcolm, he said to me over coffee time that we're beating ourselves up and I often think that in the UK and it was interesting here at Jeremy this morning we need to talk with one voice and I really do think that in this country we've got some amazing people great resources a great track record some very creative individuals and we can come up with solutions but I do worry that we're not we should all be giving that message you know sort of we're doing it because I think we don't even talk about, I mean, Jeremy talked about how HIV has changed in our lifetimes. In our lifetimes, our life expectancy has gone up at least two decades. And we don't talk about these sorts of things. I mean, societal <laughs> engagement is important, but we need to communicate the benefits and, and not criticize industry, not criticize regulators, not criticize, you know, these are difficult, complex problems and we need to come together and I'd be grateful if you four would just give us one thing that we can do together today. Uh, uh, Jeremy. I think Chaz has framed it really importantly, and, and I do think this is really critical. And, and it's really critical now, not, not in a year's time. Right. So my take uh, uh, of the political system is that we're in a chaotic situation at the moment where there is only one issue within government. We all know what that is, and it's, and it's meant there's effectively been no functioning government for some considerable time. At some point, humanity moves on. And when that moves on, and I don't know how it'll end, but then politicians will be desperately looking for new ideas because there, there's been no intellectual um, <laughs> thinking around what the new ideas are because everything's been consumed with Brexit. If this community waits for that moment, scratches its heads and thinks, what should we do? We're stuffed. So what we've got to do is spend the next few months trying to raise our head above the nonsense of the political cycle of the moment and think, what do we really want? And be ready with something, something tangible, might call it a document, that can go onto the Chancellor's table and the new Prime Minister's table and say, we're offering you a vision. And we've got to be ready for that rather than reacting to it when that moment comes. Because that moment will come. Yeah. And it'll come sooner than people think with the political cycle. And we can't let that moment grasp because there's many other bits that will have themselves ready. So we've got to get ready for that moment. And we've got to do that thinking now. And Jeremy, have you shaped that already, that, that document? Because I wholeheartedly agree. <laughs> a little bit, obviously. I, I wouldn't say that unless we had. But, but, but we, we haven't sort of... We, we've got to come together, as, as Chaz said, as one. And it's got to be around... And you've got to under, we've got to understand the political um, environment that we're in. Uh, and it does. We can't ignore it. It does have things around the Golden Triangle. It does have things about... And this has to be framed as a health issue. It's also got to be framed as an innovation and economic and economic growth issue. Because the thing that politicians are most scared about at the moment is what is going to happen to the economy in the next decade, and it could easily flatline. And this is an industry which can transform that. But if we scratch our heads when that moment comes and say, we'll come back to you in a year's time with a coherent thing, we'll have missed the opportunity. Correct. And that can't just be asking for money for what we already do. There has to be Correct. a vision for healthcare in the, in, Correct. in the UK. And it can't be a whinge. Because honestly, I've been, in, as many of you have, within uh, the Chancellor, uh, the, the Treasury and the Home Office, and often, I hate to say it, but the academic community does whinge a bit. We all do. And those letters go to the bottom of the in-tray of the ministers of X, Y and Z. Yeah. We've got to offer 
despite how difficult it is, we've got to offer a positive vision of where this community and industry will take us in the context of the political climate we're in. Yeah, so I said earlier that I, I will pinch anyone's good ideas for the good of our sector and for the good of my company. And before the last election, um, I, I was sitting on a CBI thing and the automotive industry had absolutely got their lobby sorted out. And they said, well, irrespective of which flavour of government we have, this is what we're going to do. And if we don't get that here, then frankly, you know, we're going to do this here, we're going to do that. And it was all mapped out. And I sent it to the ABP, I said, you know, we should do that. Um, and you're right, it would give people the answer rather than the questions. Let's reflect on that last point, because I've just been to China and lecturing about the Chinese economy and how it's the growth rate shrinking. And how they want it to be 6%, but it's, and it's 8 and it's going down to 4 and, and you argue, you know, where's that extra growth rate going to come from? And two years ago, you couldn't get, get away with it. But now you say it's all about productivity. It's about boosting your productivity by two or three percent. And there's a real interest in China. And in these areas, they throw money at it because that's what they see. And then you come here and we've just had this record low level of productivity in the UK and flat, flatlining productivity and talks about where the economy is going, whatever. And there's just it's it's a it's a card. It's a, it's a winning card to play, actually. When I look at this space and you know digital stuff and the, all these new innovations coming along, why can't you play really really hard? Play that card that this is a thing that could get that number up. Just a, just a thought and something you know to articulate. Mm. The Chinese are doing it. <laughs> this is where it's all going over there. Well, we come back here and I, I came into the, the into um, uh, London yesterday on the bus and I thought, gosh, this par parochial little town with little tower blocks. In China, there's just they just have a completely different mentality, and we need a little bit of that. It does disappoint me the uh, you know the, the constant drive on the two point four percent by twenty twenty seven. And for as long as I can remember, you know, we've been low teens because we, we have to be because that's the nature of our business. And so it's the, it's the other sectors which need picking up, you know, for the general economy. Um. I, 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 one question is to what extent we address issues with the NHS, because it's all very well talking about fancy omics and AI. There's points out we don't even weigh people from year to year, whatever, or measure their blood pressure, right? So, uh, um, you know, if we just weighed people every year throughout their lifespan and did a number of simple tests, that might be a predictor of uh, a, a disease in aged people. But to what extent this community wants to get into the NHS issues, I, I don't know. But, but if we're going to do that, there has to be clear economic benefit if we're going to get substantial amounts of money from the government. And, and they, they will listen. An example would be the, the uh, case that was made for mental health diseases. It was the case made to George Osborne was the, that is the only disease that affects the tax revenue to a first approximation. And so it did. It was uh, hundreds of millions, a billion or so, went into CBT therapy. Now, arguably, there should be even more, but, but they will listen if we make the economic case. I guess the point for that is, is it, the NHS's, is it the NHS's job? People are now actually taking their own health into their own hands, collecting their own data. Now, at the moment, that's not joined up because they're, you know, they, they're weighing themselves. They've got Fitbits. I'm wearing right. one at the moment. And so it's, to, it, it's ways to access that data and understand the regulation of that data because everyone, I think, where we should move to is actually they should own their own health data and then take it to the NHS and say, look at this, how can you help me? What, rather than the, the owners being on the NHS to collect it, store it, keep it safe. And actually, so it's that regulation and that policy, which is much more on, on the government's uh, agenda, I think, or should be, uh, to enable people to take accountability for their own health. I think the, uh, the, con the continuum of wellness to illness and the mapping of that and using the data for that will come with convergence, will become increasingly important. And the thing I was thinking about when I asked the question about social science, at the moment, you know, the use of electronic health records is, well, it's going to put your insurance premium up or you're not going to get insured. It's all doom and gloom. Some people mm. don't want to know. Yep. Frankly, I do. Mm. I want all my information in one place so it can help a physician who might want to help me. And I think if you had social scientists who helped you get to that position where the general public and the Daily Mail thought it was a good idea to effectively mine anonymised electronic health records, I think that would be the biggest sink of inward investment for biotech and pharma coming in to help mine. To, and it's great that it's competitive. It's mm. great that we have access to that information. We're competing with the other companies. That's what it's all about.
I think um, another area as well, just to bring it in, Bridget, with the reimbursement, is around early access programs and how we um, utilize them more effectively as well. So where you have access to a drug, uh, before it's actually reimbursed, you have this period where you can get early access. And having worked in those areas quite a lot, especially around AMR as well, you kind of realize how exciting that period can be in terms of how you treat patients and uh, the engagement with the community as well and the way that things can just map out. I can remember we set up a, a, a pathway with Public Health England um, where they will do the pathology and then they will contact us and then we will liaise with the microbiologist. And that would work so well, we actually expanded out to, we had patients from Australia and Germany being you know, brought into Public Health England here and contacting us. And then you have the disconnect when you then get commercial access to the products and, and the way it's then, I would say, the communication is kind of watered down in terms of how you, you know, the effectiveness and the positioning of products. And then you see in other countries as well, like France or Canada, where the early access works really well. And you think to yourself, if there's a way that UK can really, you know, own that early access space, you know, the R&D size, great. But that little bit in the middle where you kind of get the reimbursement and how you collect that data for patients as well. And I think in AMR, there's that disconnect because we know that AMR is a huge issue. A lot of us under, totally understand it. But on the ground level, you know, you're only looking at like five patients for certain antibiotics being treated in a year. You know, these new agents, just five patients. How valuable are those five patients? Um, you know, and, and combinations of care as well and the experimentation that happens as well. So. I think this, that period between reimbursement and, and, and the phase three results is really that key area where we can really start to drive the communication and the access for patients and really understand where the value really lies for products as well. That's a little bit more specific, I guess. Chance. I, mean, I, I honestly think we need to um, create a real clear and exciting vision for healthcare in the UK in the next 20, 30, 40 years. Uh, I think we're all agreed that the people who have most influence on, say, government is either senior industrialists or uh, some representative from a patient organization. And I wonder if we could encourage one of those individuals to convene representatives from all the stakeholders and do exactly what Jeremy say. If, you, if, I, if an academic leads it, it'll be look as if it's self-serving. If it, maybe even if an industry leads, it might look as if it's self-serving. But maybe somebody who's worked in industry understands economic pressures. I'm thinking of Andrew Whitty, Malcolm. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe we could persuade somebody like that or a very senior patient advocate who could convene that. And we can demonstrate this, if we do this, this will help the NHS, it'll help patients in the UK and across the world, it'll help industry, we will make use of all these academic infrastructures and clinical resources and all these big things that we've invested in in the UK over the past 10, 20 years, etc. Maybe, Jeremy, your organization's already doing it, but I, I, I do think we need to do this because at the moment we're just too fragmented, a little bit not ambitious enough, maybe. So, uh, Chaz, I agree with everything you said, but there is a danger if you go to government, very short time span with a diffuse idea of revolutionising the NHS as a citizen. I completely agree with it. But it might be, that might be a separate, I'm just suggesting, might be a separate point to making the political one about staying in the European Science Club. <laughs> Uh, and getting the yeah, leaders and major representatives of major ph pharma companies going in to see Chancellor and saying, you know, this is, it's crucially important that we do this. Thanks. I've just got one point about stakeholders. Um, we're currently uh, politically blue. We might become politically red. Has anyone thought about including the trades unions in this? And they might have a very strong voice in government in the future. And if we can get some trades union leaders on board as well, because it's a major healthcare issue for their employees, uh, well, for their members. Um, if we can persuade all political colours to join the club, then I think we might have more push with whatever we end up with politically. Yeah, I think that's, that's an thought. excellent idea. <laughs> Good idea. Yeah. Could, could I ask just one thing, uh, 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 Malcolm and Joan? In terms of affordable medicine, this is a global scale from Jeremy's thought. Uh, in GSK, have the Tres Cantos sure. initiative, yeah. where you 
doing great work in Mary or whatever, but would it be fees, which is a largely altruistic operation as I understand it, but the, the issue is a scale, resources you can't put. In a fantasy world, could you have 10 of the major pharmaceutical companies all put in that kind of investment on the same site to cure TB? I, I think lots of- Eradicate TB? I mean, lots of the, the companies have got uh, initiatives. I mean, people, are proud to work for the company and want to work for the company because of the things we do. It's always a portfolio. You're going to have things which are going to make your money in the Western world. Those things you should be doing in the, in the um, less developed countries. Um, I personally have used Treskantos over a number of years as a way of changing um, bits of culture within the Western disease part of our organisation. Um, I mean, I can remember taking um, in fact, taking the trust out to welcome, uh, out to uh, Tres Cantos. And we had an IP um, lawyer, and they were absolutely bricking it because it was so open. And I think people who go there, I, mean, I think we've got something like 120 of our own scientists, and then yeah, we've got capacity for another 30 uh, others coming in with a good idea. You know, their lateral thought, they have access to our uh, containment facilities, uh, every single synthetic route on any compound uh, and the compound library. You can't do that for all diseases. <laughs> you know, it's not the candy store. It has to be done in a controlled way. But clearly it was the right thing to do. You know, we, we started the pattern pooling, then other people took it on. Um, it's always, tr the trusts are always an early partner because they always see it's a good idea. And, you know, it's no surprise that, a lot of the funding that goes into that group is Gates, DNDI, MMV, Welcome Trust. But even in that field, and I wouldn't say it was, it wasn't welcome. I was at this sort of meeting at a coffee break. I said, why doesn't X charity get with Y charity to work together for this? And they said, you've got to appreciate this competition between charities as well. Yeah, there is. And, 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 I thought, <laughs> and with the smaller ones, you know, let's be honest, with the smaller ones, I had this conversation with somebody yesterday. Um, with the smaller ones, there's a level of naivety. Um, it's very well-meaning, but actually, you know, the people standing outside Tesco's are wasting their money collecting for some of the research that's undergoing some of the small ones. Um, and I've sat on a few of these things, and I think the more people you get who are, show a different perspective, you know, who come from the industry, industry side, perhaps were once in it and are no longer in it. I mean, the, the trust group of people that they have advising them mm. on their projects, they are just the right people because they've seen it, they've been burnt, they've been scarred <laughs> by the things that uh, haven't worked. And opening that up, I think anything where there's people exchange, so you see, you know, what's happening on the other side of the fence. That's why we've got, you know, at any one time, we'll have at least six to eight visiting professors, good scientists who spend up to 80% of their time in the university base to see what's going on to help shape what they're doing. We've got the immunology network at Stevenage where we've got, and the IP uh, people at GSK were absolutely panicking there because we've got half a dozen really good scientists from around the world um, who are coming there. They own all the IP on anything they do while they're there. But they're kicking the tires of our science. They're seeing the quality of our science. They're seeing all the tools and uh, toys that we've got in house, and some of them wanting to stay. You know, and that's the, it's not a recruitment thing. It's because actually we want people to know the science we're doing. We want other people to look at our science because we don't want to be so inward looking. Um, and I can remember one of the senior managers at GSK thinking that it really was a stupid idea. Well, now we're thinking about doing another one, but we're doing it in Boston. So. Um, yeah, anything where there's people transfer and an open-mindedness and a transparency, if you've got a common aim and objective, you know, it has to be a good thing. Uh, like One quick point. So just think about what Jeremy and you guys are talking about, a really different initiative. And was wondering, there are so many countries, I cite Brazil because I lived there, grew up there, which have their own state-funded pharmaceutical setup, Fiocruz, and also Cuba, they just produce their own vaccines. So for many critical areas where perhaps the industry or the smaller groups are not addressing, I think, I wonder when it's time to stop excuse the word, puts the foot in the round. We're setting HDR here. We are setting uh, NHS digital there, which are the small piece meals. But there are actually a big, well, there's a big gap that 
perhaps the government can step up and say, we're doing this, but it's not exclusive of companies. All these um, country-owned farmers, they also do a lot of partnership work. I believe GSK has a few with Fio Cruz in Brazil, right? Yeah. So, and perhaps that would be one way. And I've actually had a opportunity to discuss this with Jim O'Shaughnessy previously when he was uh, uh, with the Department of Health. And I said, look, this is a very simple model that the UK community already can accept, which is the BBC model. Taxpayers pay for TV programs, which are then used by the taxpayers for free. NHS can take care of that. And there's actually licensed out there for the benefit of really feeding back into the group that generated. So just a thought here that perhaps mm -hmm. we should start moving into that. To Malcolm's point, the data that we have in the past accumulated to Andrew's point, that is something no other group can get, this time machine. Now, even if China, US start investing this now, they won't have the 20, uh, for, sorry, 40, 50 years data. So if we don't try to capture this now, we might lose a boat because they will start capturing data and they will kill that, 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 that lead we have. Just a few thoughts of you know, things we can do as a, as a community with all different groups. So one, one of the uh, general points that um, I always like to make when I go to universities because there's, there is still some arrogance around about, you know, don't you do drug screening or something, you know, run along. Um, if you look at biological science, you look at the Nesta study from about six, seven years ago, um, and they did it really to show that the UK punched above its weight in biological sciences, which it did against half a dozen other countries. But they showed the field weight the citation um, indices for the countries, and then it was academics alone. Uh, but then in industry, in six out of seven countries, the impact was higher. Well, that doesn't surprise me because rather than being forced to publish, we're only going to publish when we've got something to say. But the really interesting thing in that study was that when the two came together, it was slightly bigger again. And that's exactly what I might expect because you've got the, the project-driven, excellent scientist in industry who's working with the laterally thinking academic who's pinging the ideas around and you're pulling it together. And that should be the message. And that's evidence-based, that's data. So, yeah, and we need, there's an industry that we have, uh, Harbord touched on, there's a, a pharmacies, whatever, which are embedded in all these countries. Companies like Walgreens Boots make fortunes out of Brazil, Egypt, whatever, and keep quiet about it. Uh, but there's a huge potential there for, 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 for health benefits uh, that we should be uh, tapping into as well. We help the Brazilians spend, I mean, the SGC are in Campinas. I mean, we help the Brazilians spend some of their money because they have to spend so much money in, the, in that region. Um, Petrobras all about discovery, not, not really R&D. They couldn't spend the tax uh, enough. Yeah, so we were helping them spend it on, on things that were relevant to healthcare. So I'm going to get in trouble now unless we finish very soon. But the one thing we have agreed is representatives of major companies together with trade unions and patient representatives, maybe one academic, which could be Jeremy, are going to go, are going to, go to whoever is the chancellor sometime in the next uh, six months or so, with a vision. Thanks for staying, Jeremy. Yeah. <laughs>